It's my great pleasure now to welcome and introduce our panelists, Professor Sandra Black, who's Professor of Economics and also of International and Public Affairs, and our two uh, students, Drashti Brambat and Bernice Kamach San Martin. Now, Professor Black joined us a couple of years ago, and uh, I really feel uh, thrilled to have her uh, at Columbia uh, University. She is a leading economist who works on labor economics in a very policy relevant uh, fashion, both empirical work uh, and highly, I think, policy relevant. She also comes with deep experience having worked uh, at the Council of Economic Advisors. Um, and um, as you will see, um, uh, she works a lot on inequality and also on uh, kind of long-term effects of early life experiences, as well as on uh, gender uh, discrimination um, issues. You have her bio. I will be brief in the value of hearing from her directly. Um, and you will also hear from two students, uh, two amazing um, individuals and you have their bios, but uh, let me uh, say Drashti Brambat is uh, MPA 21, graduating shortly, uh, second year student in uh, urban and um, social policy. I think she has a real passion around working on, uh, on uh, collaborations between um, government officials and community-based organizations. And I'll let her speak more to that. And Bernice, I won't pronounce your name uh, properly, Camacho San Martin, also graduating before you know it uh, with an MPA, uh, is a concentrator in human rights and humanitarian affairs. She's a Mexican lawyer as well who worked on advancing human rights and has had some extraordinary life experiences, which is part of the joy for us is to have uh, students who join us who are young professionals who've been deeply engaged in different ways and add so much uh, to our experiences and to the classroom. So without further delay, let me invite Professor Black to tell us a little bit about her work and then invite our students to share perspectives around some really intriguing capstones that I think that have allowed them to take their passions into some applied experiences, but also you'll see, I think, some nexus between themes here that is very, very special. So with that, Professor Black. Great, well, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm really excited to be at SEPA now. Uh, I just finished teaching a course in making US economic and social policy and got to interact with a lot of students and I'm working on a capstone as well. So it's been a lot of fun. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my research, which focuses broadly on economic inequality and economic mobility kind of broadly defined. And so the, the big motivating questions for me are why do children from poor families grow up to be poor while children from rich families grow up to be rich? And what's the role of public policy, including things like education and the so social safety net as mediators? Um, and so I thought I would talk just a little bit about one recent project I have uh, that's focused on wealth inequality. Uh, and you may have noticed that's got a lot of attention in, in the press these days, particularly in light of recent discussions about introducing a wealth tax. Uh, just to give you some statistics about wealth inequality, in the United States, the median net worth of upper income families doubled in a 30 year period, while the median net worth actually declined for lower income families. So as we've seen, the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. Uh, and it's really at the very top, we see the most uh, astounding growth. So the top 0.1% of households own 22% of total household wealth in 2012. And that's up from only 7% in the 1970s. So we've really seen this explosion. Importantly, there's also a lot of persistence across generations. So wealthy parents tend to have children who themselves become wealthy, making societal wealth inequality even more troubling. So if everyone could kind of move around, uh, work hard and, and have the opportunities and then become very wealthy, that would be very different than if there is a lot of persistence across generations where it's, you know, you're kind of stuck where your parents are stuck. Um, and so my research has really focused recently on trying to understand 
why parents' wealth is so correlated uh, with children's wealth. So what is it that's going on? And this is actually a really hard question to, to answer uh, empirically because there are so many different things going on. So we have genetics, so you know, higher uh, abilities. Parents might have higher ability children, and that's kind of been shown to be true. Uh, children from a particular neighborhood, parents move to a particular neighborhood, and that might help their kids, and there's a lot of work suggesting that is also true. Um, Parents have different parenting styles, and that might be correlated with parents' wealth and income. And family resources just might help help kids. So growing up with a wealthier family means that I can buy more opportunities for my kids, and they're going to do better. So separating, because all these things are happening at the same time, separating individual components out is actually very difficult. But from a policy perspective, it's crucial, right? You need to know what's causing the, the persistence to understand how to, how to mitigate it. Um, and so what we do in my research with, with co-authors is, is kind of take a first pass at this and say, let's try to break it into nature and nurture. So kind of pre-birth factors. So things like inheriting uh, uh, ability or, or personality traits or something like that to the extent that it's genetic and how much of it is environment. And so the opportunities that my parents give me uh, either through their parenting or through their uh, through their resources uh, otherwise, and, and, and which is more important. And so dis the way to disentangle this, or the way that we go about it, is to use some adoptees. So the nice thing about adoptees is that they break the link between the genetics of the parent and the environment and resources of the parent. And so, um, and so by using data from Sweden, and adoptees born between 1950 and 1970, so they're kind of uh, uh, middle-aged now uh, in our sample, we can see uh, kind of how important biological and adoptive parents are for the, the children's wealth. And so what is unique and why are we looking at Sweden? Not because we think Sweden is the most interesting country, but a nice feature of, of uh, Sweden in, between 1950 and 1970 was that adoptions were all through the state. There was no private adoption. And importantly, Sweden kept data on both the adoptive parents and the biological parents. And so we can see what the wealth of adoptive parents and biological parents are and relate that to the wealth of the, the child. And so if we see that the wealth of the uh, adoptive parent is more important, that suggests that environment is more important, right? Because there's no genetics there, it's all environment. And if we see that, that the wealth of the biological parent is more important, then that would suggest an important role for, for nature, that, that it's, it's something genetic or pre-birth. Um, and so we, we do this using the, the data from, from Sweden. And what we find is really interesting. We find that uh, without inheritances, we're not, the parents have to be alive in our sample for most of it. And so uh, what we see is that wealth is primarily uh, environmentally driven in that adoptive parents are much more important than uh, biological parents in terms of children's wealth. And so it really is environment that's important. When we let parents die in our sample, so now we add back in the parents who don't live so we kids can get inheritances now, that kind of blows up, right? It becomes even bigger because now uh, uh, adoptive parents can not only kind of provide all these resources, but literally give kids wealth. And so when we do that, adoptive parents become even more important and, and really swamps any kind of uh, nature effect. Um, and so what we do once we find that environmental uh, uh, channels are important, we start thinking about what, what could it actually be. And it seems like some of this is working that uh, uh, parents help by increasing children's education and income, like the parents' environment and resources improve children's education and income, which will lead to higher wealth. And interestingly, we find that savings is not an important channel. And in fact, children of wealthy parents, wealthy adoptive parents, actually save less, which makes sense if you think about it, because they don't need that safety net. They have their parents as the safety net. Um, and so I think 
future research is going to continue kind of thinking about how to disentangle uh, this. One thing that we think about in our paper is just how is wealth different from other outcomes that people have looked at. And so that's really interesting. Using our same data set, we can look at education and income. And importantly, education is really much more biologically driven, more nature. So biological parents have a much larger influence in children's educational attainment. Um, while wealth is, is primarily environmental and income is kind of in between the two, as you might, that, that both nature and nurture seem to have important roles. Um, and so what this suggests to us is that there's an important role for policy to equalize these opportunities, that it really is opportunities kind of post birth that matter a lot. Uh, and the fact that we find this in Sweden, which is a really relatively egalitarian society, suggests that policy is likely even more important in a society in like the United States where there's much more inequality. And I think this is particularly true now. So we've seen kind of with the advent of the pandemic and, and COVID, uh, that's really exacerbated the existing inequalities in our society. So it's kind of made us see where our social safety net is failing uh, and widened the inequality that we already had, which was large. And so I think that suggests an even more important role for policy interventions right now. And so that's why it's such an interesting time from a policy perspective, because it is so important uh, you know, with the pandemic to to think about this. Um, so I could talk for a long time about this, but I will stop there and uh, we can we can move on. <laughs> Thank you so much. Let me just say to our audience, please feel free to uh, start throwing in a few questions in our chat so we can get to them when when uh, in just a few minutes. But first, let me uh, invite our um, Drashti to lead us off with a few comments about her own perspectives and experience. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And it's a real pleasure and honor to be here today. It's really hard following up after Professor Black, but I'm going to give it a go. Um, I just wanted to follow up on one note that she said. I think that there's a real reckoning in this country about wealth and income inequality. And I think that, you know, one thing I really learned from SIPA is that sometimes these big policy challenges seem unfathomable, unfathomable to like many people, but I think that there's clear policy roots and there's actually things that we can do about this, whether it's, you know, incremental change, big change, whatever it might be, that there's actual policy solutions to these types of issues. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit briefly about the project, the capstone that I got to work on this semester, and it's been a real pleasure. Um, uh, fellow students and I, we were working with the Center for Popular Democracy, which is an advocacy group headquartered here in New York City that has a real racial and economic justice agenda. Um, and it works, we worked with CPD and seven of their affiliate organizations all across the country. So CPD's long-term goal is kind of ensuring that um, everyone in America is, is insured with health coverage. Um, through a single payer um, system. But of course, there's short term goals that the organization has in itself, which is making sure that all those eligible for Medicaid, for example, are able to get it. And these are things that we can have an influence on, whether those are advocacy groups, government officials, students like ourselves, um, that really are pushing for these good governance models that um, you know, should be bipartisan in nature. So the students and I, we got to work on um, a survey that kind of captured quantitative and qualitative data on the barriers to Medicaid access. And, you know, the situation is super severe in our country. We have seven, 70 million Americans who identify as low income. The scale is, you know, monumental. There's 20 percent of our population that receives health care, health coverage through Medicaid. Um, and in 2019, you know, we had 11 percent of Americans uninsured. Um, and with COVID, that only, you know, exacerbated the crisis, um, but also put a lot more folks um, on Medicaid with almost an 11.8% growth, um, meaning about seven and a half million more um, enrollees in Medicaid. So through our um, project, we identified, we were trying to identify the main barriers experienced by those already eligible for Medicaid, but um, couldn't actually receive it in some way or just had general challenges. And we identified four major kind of, um, or five major types of areas. One, the administrative perspective of, you know, too much paperwork, too many difficult deadlines to make, 
difficulty understanding what the application and requirements are. For example, in Texas, one would need three years of tax returns um, to kind of just even apply for Medicaid, which is kind of mind boggling to me. Um, the second kind of barrier uh, category was about service. So the Medicaid system infrastructure itself, where folks were on the calls, you know, for hours, offices were closed when trying to apply things that are like really easily fixed or theoretically that we can actually fix in our country. The third kind of barrier was more structural in that the societal forces that really um, push folks who aren't able to kind of um, apply on time, whether that's internet access with, you know, only 56% of adults in this country with an income less than $30,000 have internet access, which is major because one of the main forms of applying to Medicaid is through a website. The fourth barrier is about stigma of applying through um, for any type of welfare. And the last barrier is about the legal infrastructure of the ever-changing federal and state law eligibility requirements, especially with work. So in the end, we kind of, um, we're still digging through some of the results um, because we still have a little bit more time to submit the report, but we almost had you know, 300 responses from our survey data collection and we've identified huge service barriers, whether those are wait times or um, you know, administrators not picking up on the phone or calling with an unknown number so you can't actually call them back. Um, and we're really excited and looking forward to kind of um, producing concrete recommendations that CBD can use um, to advocate for actual change um, with Medicaid administrators. But yes, thank you so much. Thank you very much. I think our capstones really are quite a defining feature of our program. And that's so what you're hearing are just a couple of the, of the 80 such that we run annually uh, with thanks to Suzanne Holman and the whole team. Bernice, please tell us about your experience. Yes, thank you so much, Dean, and thank you for this opportunity to, to talk about my, uh, my experience at SIPA and how this has allowed me to engage with inequality issues, uh, like following uh, this conversation, as Professor Black just mentioned, um, systemic inequality is something affecting disproportionately women. And so just to walk you a little bit um, to my project, so my team and I are currently um, we're currently conducting some research for the New York Women's Foundation. They are a philanthropic organization that's currently um, looking only or working only in the within the five boroughs of New York City. And given that they are willing to expand um, their operations, we've been asked to look into Long Island and the Mid Hudson Valley regions, so that we can um, search for potential partnerships and especially uh, with the gender in the intersectional lens. So as part of our project, we have been uh, mainly focusing on three issue areas, uh, all touching on different aspects of social justice. So we're looking into reproductive justice, mainly on reproductive rights. We're also taking a look at youth leadership uh, and childcare, because these are the issue areas that they were more interested in, in working in these regions. And so after conducting some landscape analysis, some in-depth uh, interviews, we have been able to identify some of the most salient issues in these communities, which surprisingly for us, were not necessarily related to what we were, we were initially looking at. So like, for instance, one of the most Im impacting issues in these areas is the criminal reform and an increase, uh, like a substantial increase in the rate of incarcerated women. We're talking about unaffordable housing, uh, unaffordable childcare, right? And so all of these issues here that have been uh, impacting women of color disproportionately. And um, so yeah, our, our project has been definitely uh, guided through an intersectional and very gender lens, which has uh, provided us a very, very um, interesting analysis of inequality of state systemic racism. And so, yeah, I think my team being especially from, uh, from like predominantly from international students, we have been able to engage with inequality and with um, especially poverty issues, like way beyond the academic uh, arena. So that has been very, very enlightening for us. And yeah, I think it's been a great experience. So thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. I mean, we often talk about and think of ourselves as a school as providing deep academic learning skills and applied experiences. And here is an example where we're, we happen to be talking about two sets of programs that were very directed at our own immediate community, which is something we also try to do and be helpful about, but with participants 
you know, from around the world. So they're taking those lessons from the American experience and hopefully forward wherever they may go, as well as hopefully in the United States as we advance these issues informed by academic learning, um, uh, Sandy's strong implications from Swedish data, but uh, very much relevant globally and hopefully in the United States as well. And in, in that vein, we have a question that's come in and I invite others to please feel free to send in some questions uh, from Moselle Thompson who asks, you know, that they're, they're, how, how does your work dovetail with studies like Pew and others that look at the disproportionate effect of recessions and this one on Black and Hispanic family wealth. I wonder if you have a comment on that. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think this brings up a really important question or, or issue in this literature, which is, and I was talking to some of my students about this, because if every, if everyone had equal opportunities and everything was the same, you might not want perfect equality uh, across generations. You wouldn't necessarily, you might think there still should be some persistence because if parents work hard and teach their children to work hard, and maybe we think that people who work hard should get higher wealth and more income because they're working hard. And so that type of inequality or persistence, we might think is okay from a societal perspective. But I think when you think about, uh, for example, uh, uh, Black and Hispanics uh, and look at, at their wealth trajectory, a lot of this uh, is, is a, a historical artifact, right? That, that because of uh, the way our society was structured and, and history uh, has led to more limited opportunities, which has led to kind of lower wealth accumulation. And so it becomes particularly important to address these inequalities when that's the kind of persistence that we're, we're holding on to, right? That it's it's kind of the structural problem that then is persisting across generations and becomes even more important to break that link. And so I think this is, you know, particularly notable for these populations because it is kind of, a, there is a clear historical kind of uh, reason for for what we see and and we we need to break this this link and and again i know uh i i always have the you know why do we care about sweden but if you think about it if the environment matters so much in a place like sweden where they already have you know public health insurance they have public schooling for you know through post-secondary schooling then it suggests it's going to be even more important for, for our populations. And so I, th I think that, that that's a really important point. So let me invite uh, our, our, our guests and friends. They should feel free to send in questions, you know, of any kind. You can ask our students. They've made themselves available about their SEPA experience or anything you'd like uh, to them to comment on. And, um, and, and while I'm waiting for uh, some more questions, let me, let me just um, push you a little bit, if I may, Professor Black, on the question of breaking the link. I mean, we think of ourselves as training people to think about public policy issues informed by data and then helping to design policies that can make a difference. So how do we take these ideas into the world uh, to break the link and have them be receptive in different contexts? So I think, I think that's a great question. And this is really, as I mentioned, I, I'm teaching this new course on making US economic and social policy. And this is really what I'm trying to, to push the students to think about, which is kind of how do we take what we know from research and kind of translate that into the policy world where we know that there is this persistence and we know kind of, you know, we have different uh, research looking at different ideas and, and how, you know, if they're not studying that specific thing, how can we use this, you know, data from Sweden, for example, to inform policy in the United States. And I think one thing that, that is clear is that, um, as we learn more in research about the benefits of things like access to Medicaid and access to food stamps um, and access to income when, when you're a kid and growing up in a better neighborhood. And recently there's been a lot of really important economic research suggesting that things like uh, having Medicaid when you're three years old 
has really important long run benefits to you in terms of long run health, but also income and uh, education. And the same thing with food stamps um, and growing up in a better neighborhood has kind of long run benefits. I think taking that and using that to make the case for these policies that increase opportunities for lower income families, I think is really a good way to use that research to kind of say, okay, look, we can, we, we think it's a good idea, but here's, we can quantify these benefits uh, and, and, and kind of move, uh, put a number on how, how beneficial it'll be. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions from our audience? We also, audience, uh, from our friends, colleagues, and also uh, any number of faculty members are with us in case you want to throw in a thought or two. Um, so here's a, here's a question that's come in. It's pretty uh, fundamental to all of our uh, concerns is, uh, uh, how do you think discrimination against women actually affects opportunities uh, for for women. I don't know if there's been empirical work that Sandy's done on that, but I'm sure she has views on that. And I just thought Vasti and Bernice do too. Could I invite each of you to make a comment? Yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to start and I'm interested in hearing what, especially, you know, I know Bernice, this is what your, your capstone is really kind of getting at. Um, but in terms, of, in terms of research, there's a lot of work uh, kind of documenting the, the uh, the effects of discrimination uh, on women, um, showing that there is substantial discrimination, particularly if you look at the very top. You know, it used to be much more pervasive throughout the distribution. So, uh, uh, low wage, middle wage, high wage occupations where all women were kind of facing discrimination. What's interesting now is there's still kind of some going on where we see it the strongest is actually at the very top where you see very few CEOs, very few kind of really leaders who are women. Uh, and hopefully this is changing. But there are lots of ways I think that that this women kind of incorporate this in their decision making. So if you know you're gonna face this type of discrimination, that affects how you how you behave, right? And the choices that you make. There's also, and then I'll, I'll let the students talk, uh, I could go on for a long time about this. There's also a lot of really interesting recent research showing how when women have children, they pay a huge penalty. So men do not pay uh, an income penalty. Women pay a huge penalty. Um, it seems to be related to kind of uh, family leave policies. So if you don't have family leave policies like the United States, women often have to drop out of the labor force to take care of their kids. Also related to things like like uh, uh, childcare subsidies and things like that. But, but we're still really across uh, many developed countries still, there's just a lot of a big penalty that women face uh, as a result of, of having a family that isn't being equally shared uh, within the family, so. Thank you. I think that's felt intuitively and also demonstrated empirically, but I'm very interested what our, what Bernice and Drashti, if you have comments. Bernice, would you like to start us off? Yes, definitely. So in my opinion, I think uh, this is a case not only of uh, opportunities for women, but actually like securing outcomes. I think many policies are somehow myopic because they just focus in, in like short term solutions and sometimes uh, like lose track like or, or lose sight of long-term uh, realities and so for instance we're talking about like political representation like gender quotas and, and many affirmative actions to increase political representation in representative democracies they usually uh fall short because they only provide opportunities and like legal loopholes or policy uh, deficiencies they actually impede women from from actually achieving uh, or getting to public office or for instance, it's like just building on uh, what Professor Black was just mentioning, the lack of access to childcare, like um, insufficient leaves, they, uh, they always have the, this gender factor playing uh, against women because there's also the, this very strong stereotypical roles of women and the, 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 the simple idea of balancing life and work is only an issue for women, right? So I think this is um, both a policy and legal uh, case, but it's definitely also a matter of social norms. Thank you very much. Vashti, your thoughts? Yeah, 
just to be just to have a really brief comment is that you know when we were approaching this project we made sure that we wanted an in intersectional lens to the project which you know talked about gender talked about race and and really emphasized those two types of um um, it impacts on Medicaid access. And we noticed this overarching idea of time poverty in which lower income groups have less discretionary time than higher income groups to actually be dealing with all of these like institutional barriers that take hours and hours on the phone, for example. And what we found was that, um, you know, we're still combing through the findings, but I think that we found that women on average do have more um, longer wait times or more challenges that they've experienced and particularly black women. So we wanted to kind of incorporate the, um, and you know mold into the both um, approaches of race and gender itself. But thank you so much for the question. It's extremely important. Thank you. And now of course we have a flurry of questions and only <laughs> a couple of minutes left, but let me just articulate them in case you haven't everyone heard them because they're great questions and then give our, our speakers uh, one minute each. Uh, you know, one of the questions is, um, you know, how, do our, how does our community feel about the challenge of policy leadership that, you know, we have to restore fact-based inquiry and decision-making. That's something we talk about all the time. Of course, it's been a hard, hard period and there's uh, some return to it. I don't think, I don't mean that as a political statement. I think it's objectively more informed um, uh, than it has been. Uh, but a second comment has been really directed at, at Professor Black about um, uh, developing countries and um, uh, what do you watch for there? And um, has uh, environment been an element uh, of, of inequality and poverty? So uh, one comment from each of you before we break off into our breakout sessions. Let me start with Professor Black and then literally a minute. Okay, um, so I couldn't do it in developed country, developing country just because of the data, you, you need really good data. So we would love to do it in a developing country. And there is a lot of research on the role of environment and pollution and poverty and, and the link between them. So there is definitely a link there. Um, in terms of uh, fact-based or fact-based policy making, I think, I think the key is that, that people need to feel heard and understand, understood. And so if you don't speak at them, you speak with them. It really helps engage them more, at least from my own experience. And so, um, and you just kind of keep trying, you know, you keep giving the numbers and, 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 and try to listen to what they're saying too, to make sure that you're actually addressing the problems that that they're having, right? Instead of telling them what their problems are, listen to what their problems are and speak to them that way. So that's that was my experience uh, in DC. So I will, Thank I you think that was, my min, that was my minute. <laughs> well, but those were wonderful, wonderful and important <laughs> words. Vashti, a final thought? Yeah, just a final thought. Uh, on, on policy is that, you know, so with working with an advocacy group like CPD, organizers and activists know that these policy, that these predicaments exist, you know, from anecdotal evidence, from, from working on the ground, that there are huge, huge barriers to Medicaid, and these are things that can be fixed. But I think what our report and our study shows is that, you know, we have the evidence, we have this multi, you know, huge, huge survey that we have 300 responses from to show that it's not one off, it's a systemic problem that exists in every state across the country. So I think that's really important to put in front of Medicaid administrators that these are things that we can fix and need to be fixed and have real, real roots of, um, of evidence from each state to show. Thank you, Bernice. Yeah, so just uh, two quick uh, thoughts that I had while, uh, while, my, um, while Professor Black was actually speaking was like, the first of all, I echo her thoughts totally about the, the fact that it's necessary to take the people who you're like doing policy for to actually take them into account. I think that it has been like definitely my biggest takeaway from SIPA uh, from these two amazing years. And another issue is that every time someone has to be looking at it's like social justice issues, I think intersectionality has to be a huge part of the of the focus of any project. Thank you so much.